I'm excited about getting into the Word of God, and today we're going to be talking about God's righteousness um, and what righteousness is in our lives as we're going through the armor of God uh, throughout a series here, uh, really understanding the armor of God in its fullness uh, and how it is going to benefit each and every one of us at the end of these uh, sermons, I'm hoping, and also enlighten us to give us a better and more spiritual insight to the armor of God. So I just wanted to tell you guys that we'll be calling this message Embracing Righteousness. Um, and, and also, I just want to say thank you for those that are watching live on Facebook. Uh, uh, it's good to see you on Facebook. If, if you would like to come to the sanctuary, we'd love to have you and see your beautiful face. So please come and join us uh, here soon. Um, we're going to be continuing, as, as I just said, this, this armor of God, this understanding of the armor of God and and what the armor of God has for us. So we started by speaking about truth, amen? So do you guys remember the message on truth? The the message where we have to obtain truth in order to obtain righteousness. Truth is the element, the crux, the core of our faith in this manner because without truth, how can you obtain anything to be righteous, amen? Does that make sense? And then on the way to righteousness, we had to talk about one element, which was the element of repentance. Repentance is absolutely imperative to understand, super important, because if you don't repent, again, you won't obtain righteousness. So there's this element of surprise. We, when we, when we obtain truth, truth leads us down this path of righteousness. But on the journey and on the way, we have to sort of clean up some of that dirt that we've collected over the time. And if someone says that they don't have dirt, I'm gonna tell you they do, okay? If they come and they say they have no dirt, if you watch long enough, you're gonna find that they have lots of dirt, amen? And because we all have dirt, we're not perfect, we're we're God's created, and we have to work toward being righteous like him. It's about the reflection of his character that allows us to obtain this righteousness within us. So I want to encourage you to embrace the armor of God in this manner. So as we've talked about in the past, and I just need to narrate this because this is super important to understand, is that the armor of God was not just illustrated to us for any uh, form in in the way that it was brought out, okay? We had the first element, which is the, the element of truth. If you don't obtain truth, you can't move to the next part of the armor, Okay, today, sometimes people just want to put on the, the, the helmet of salvation. Well, it doesn't work that way. We can't just put on the helmet of salvation and be absolutely bare with, without our armor. We'll be pierced and we'll be taken. Okay, we have to put on that armor to protect us against the spiritual principalities that are going to come against us. And as we get closer to the end times, it's going to become stronger and stronger, and we have to prepare ourselves. And this is how we do it. God has put on my heart to speak boldly about the armor of God, okay? And, and to be able to uh, illustrate the importance of why we put on the armor the way we do. And as we're, as we're gonna get into it here, the breastplate of righteousness can help with the battles of life. Okay, just think about something for a second. We, we create these, these obstacles in our lives sometimes, but sometimes you don't create them, they just happen, Sometimes you're walking along and something just hits you really hard, and we call that a battle. But if you're not prepared to stand through the battle, you'll be devoured. And so the armor of God is going to prepare you for the battle that's coming, the battle that's present, the battle that was in the past, the one you've already conquered. The reason you're sitting in here today is because you've already conquered some of the battles within your life, amen? If you're struggling with a battle today, I want you to know that God knows that you're struggling, okay? And that God sees your struggle. God understands your struggle. God cares about your struggle. And God's coming in his timing. You see, sometimes we want to, we want our timing, but that's not what God wants. God wants you to listen and hearken to his voice, obtain his word, be emerged into his word right here in order to put on the armor of God that he has for you. 
So from the multifaceted concept of righteousness, we can establish that righteousness itself is not merely a moral or ethical standard, but, all, but only, not only, but a divine calling that circles every aspect of our lives, okay? From waking up in the morning till departing at night, we meet righteousness with God. You see, through his word, we meet him with righteousness. And it's obtained through truth. By understanding the truth of his word, this word right here, this word right here, will either keep you from sin or sin will keep you from this word, amen? This is exactly what will keep you from sin, in order to understand sin, you must understand this. Without this, you won't understand sin. And if we don't have sin, how do we know how to become righteous in our lives? See, righteousness is the element that frees you and gives you joy and gives you peace in your life. If we don't have that, we have nothing. We're void. We're empty. It's like when the earth was created and it was void and empty. And God hovered on the face of the waters and brought glory. You see, he brought light to the world. Well, God wants to bring light to your world. You see, God wants to bring light into your world. He wants to give you light. So much light that it shines forever. And that is the meaning of the word Zadik, which we'll be talking about more. I'm going to need... Two gentlemen to grab that whiteboard. I'm going to use that at one point here during the sermon. Appreciate that. So, in the heart of the Bible, righteousness is defined as obedience. Did you know that? Do you believe me if I'm telling you that, that in the Bible, righteousness is defined as obedience? You see, in Deuteronomy 6.25, let me read exactly that. It says, then it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to observe all these commandments before the Lord our God as he has commanded us. You see, this is not just something made up. God has literally said, I have commandments that are for you. I created these things for you, and through your obedience, I'm willing to give you righteousness. And as we dig deeper into righteousness, I want you to really understand the root of what it is for you to put on the breastplate of righteousness. You see, the root of divine attributes, truth and righteousness stand out, don't they? They intricately are woven together, forming a very essence of God's character. And it is within this perfect blend that we find the core of who God really is. Can you believe it? Can you believe that that is what makes up God? Binding both truth and righteousness, they meet in perfect harmony. In perfect harmony. These attributes of God are not merely aspects, guys. Aspects of his nature, but guess what? They are a foundation. They are a foundation upon which all his actions and decrees are based. You see, without truth and without righteousness, you, you, you don't have anything to do with God. That's what I'm telling you. But it's much deeper than that. It's so much deeper than that. So I ask that you listen, please. Trusting in God's love and righteous nature will help us to understand his righteousness. Let me read something. Psalms 23, verse 3, it says, He restores my soul. He leads me in a path of righteousness. But why? For his name's sake, it says. Whoa. Guys, listen. I'm telling you, it's not for you, but it's for him. You see, he leads you down a path. He restores your soul and leads you down a path of righteousness for your name's sake. Why for his name? And why for his name's sake? You know, the realization is that God's decrees and actions are founded upon his righteous and loving character. And this is the basis of truth and faith in his name and for his name's sake. The realization is that God's decrees and his actions 
are founded upon his righteous and loving character. Let that sink in for a second, guys. Let that sink in, and it's for his name's sake. I need a volunteer, please. One that is bold. Uh, it's Ryan. I got Ryan this time. I love this man, by the way. I love this man. All right. Um, can you hold that? Okay. So, Ryan, if I were to ask you, is this word precious to you? Yep. Why? Because it is instructions for us on how to live and how to know God. He is his in. Yeah, no, I hear you. And, 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 and so you value this book because it is the word of God and it teaches you how to live and you love so much about it. So let me take this book. No, let me have it for a second. Let me, yeah, let me have this. Okay, so now you don't have this book anymore. Okay, I've taken it away. Does it still hold the value that you, that you still see it as? Yeah, yeah, but I've taken it away you see, from Ryan, he loves this book so much, but I've taken it away from him. Now, this book only becomes so precious to you because you value it, right? So what happens if this, if I were to give you something, let's just act like this was like a, a napkin, okay, and I gave this to you, would you give this to me if I asked for it? It's not a big deal, huh? Because it doesn't have the value that the Bible has. It doesn't have the value of God's word. Thank you, Ryan. And what I'm trying to tell you is that we can only trust what we value. You see, if you don't value the Bible, you can't trust the Bible. You know what? If you don't value righteousness, how could you ever obtain it? If you don't trust the word, how are you ever going to see the truth? You see, because if you look at this like cottage cheese and it has holes in it, you're never going to be able to see value in this book. But see, you value this book. And so you put a value on it. How much is this book worth, guys? What if I told you this book was the last one on earth? I just got some wows. How, how, how much would this book be worth then, guys? Priceless? You bet. Absolutely priceless. And the reason it's priceless to you is because you value the words in it. And the reason you value the words in it because you value the God that wrote them. You see? And that's where it goes. It goes to God whether or not you're a believer or an unbeliever, whether or not you believe in God or you do not believe in God, really has a lot to do with your obedience. Because he says that he leads you and restores your soul and leads you to righteousness for his name's sake. It's a choice, you see. It's a choice to value something beyond. Let's break it down. Let's break it down a little deeper. Because we believe in him, this grants leverage for righteousness to amount to something significant, does it not? It becomes a testament to God's power to change the mind and hearts of man's worship. You see, if you don't value God, you're not going to value anything that comes from God. What is holy is no longer holy. What is truth is no longer truth. And what is righteousness is no longer righteousness. You know what's interesting about all this? It has a value regardless if you believe it or not. Do you hear me? You see, if you believe in God, you'll believe in the word. You won't be embarrassed by it. You won't be ashamed by it. If you value God, you will value his word. Stop making excuses to be able to keep his word. 
Instead, we observe his word with love, with joy, and an open heart. Open heart. You know, one might say it's silly to raise their hands and allow God in. But I would have to say that you don't see the value in allowing him to come into your heart. And, and, and how sad is that? So my job is to bring this to a realization that you can open your heart and open your arms to God. You can believe that God is so real. He is so real that everything that he says has a value you cannot put a number on. Amen? And if we were to talk about value, we would all probably have a different number based on the belief and in, in God that we have. Again, Psalms 23.3 says, He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. 1 John 2.12 says, I am writing to you, little children, since your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. His name. It's not about us. It's about him. It's about his name. But guess what? It's also about the value that he has in you. You see, it's so important. It's so important that you obtain righteousness for his name's sake. Think about that. See, it's for, it's for God's name's sake, but guess what? He values you that much. You're not just someone you're an ad, you, 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 you are a disciple of God, an ambassador of God. You represent the God that formed and created this heaven. You, are, you, you worship a God that formed and created yourselves. How awesome is that? What kind of value are we going to put, what kind of value are we going to put on that? Do you believe it? You better believe it. And when you believe it, you should get excited about it. And guess what? You should be telling everyone else about it. Amen? Amen. Let's go and tell everyone right now. Let's go. <laughs> Come on. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's so important and imperative to understand that God is God because we give God value. If we don't give God value, everything in this book has no value. It's just another book we put on the shelf. You see, but when we value it, it says that we value God. It says that we value the one that put value in this book. So God values you, doesn't he? You see, he believes in you and has chosen you to place value over your life. You see, it's for his name's sake that you don't embarrass him. That you don't fall short and go crazy and follow after false gods. He's always trying to gather you back in because he loves you that much. It's for his name's sake because when your children or someone in your family devalues your name, it's not fun. Because it's embarrassing. But the only reason they can embarrass your name is because they're part of your family. So guess what? You're part of God's family, amen? And God has a value on your life. Can you believe it? It's awesome. Let me read something in Psalms. Let's turn over to Psalms so you guys can do a little work too right now. Psalms 106, and we're going to start in verse 7. So chapter 106, verse 7. Uh, 
Okay, as we read in verse 7, our ancestors in Egypt did not grasp the significance of your wondrous works or remember your many acts of faithful love. Instead, they rebelled by the sea, the Red Sea, yet he saved them for his name's sake to make his power known. You see, God, he can change you. You know, it's so our lives are selected full of this righteousness. It's because his name's sake that this is happening. And it becomes a funnel of hope, not just for your life, but for the life of others around you in this sick world. In other words, our trust and faith in God is rooted in us believing he actually exists and that he is all righteousness. If you ask me, this is the fuel that really feeds the fire, doesn't it? You see, this is the fuel that feeds the engine in the pursuit of righteousness. We are called to be like God. just like you want your children to be like you. You know, you choose to raise your children in a values with moral ethic because you want them to adopt the good things of life and treat people with respect. God wants the same thing for you. He's asking, are you willing to be obedient? Are you willing to be obedient? Are you willing to give up your own desires, your own lust, your own pleasure to be obedient for his name's sake? That's the question. If you ask me, this is what creates the pursuit of true righteousness. You see, we are called to be like God. It's about living in a way that reflects God. The depths of truth and belief in God must exist. If we don't believe in God, there is no possible way you can believe in truth. Truth will lead you to repentance. Repentance will lead you to righteousness. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we are putting on the breastplate of righteousness. Can you believe it? We're putting on the armor to stand up against the battle that is coming. This brings about the recognition to the value of righteousness and its source where righteousness actually comes from, doesn't it? You see, God's truth is absolute unchanging, reliable, guiding us towards an understanding of reality as it truly is free from falsehood or deception, isn't it? His righteousness is equally steadfast, a reflection of his unconditional commitment to you and his love in all pursuit and perfection for you. Let's turn over to Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Let's all say it together, ready? And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Guess what? You are called according to his purpose Amen. for his name's sake. Amen? Amen? That's what this is telling me. He's telling me that he created the commandments for me to observe, not to be legalistic and cause stumbling, but because it is a blessing to you. You see, if you don't believe that, try it. Try it. Try keeping the commandments but not because you have to, but because you want to. You see, if you keep the commandments 
and it becomes a stumbling and a burden to you, you're never going to see the blessing in it. But when we start to embrace the commandments as an instruction manual of love from our Heavenly Father, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. You know what's going to happen. You're going to fall in love with it. That's right. The romance story just started, didn't it? Yeah. It's like writing another book. And yes, it's hard work. No one said it was easy. Actually, the Bible even tells us that it's not easy. Together, truth and righteousness are principles of God, and he invites us to embrace all of them. And it stands for guiding us to right living that mirrors his character. Okay, so together, truth and righteousness, they are bonded, aren't they? You know, even in the armor of God in Ephesians 6, it says you put on the belt of truth and righteousness, the breastplate. It's like they're in the same sentence form because they go along with one another. You cannot have righteousness without truth. We just read it in the book of Deuteronomy. It says, in the pursuit of righteousness, you must obtain, you must observe his commandments in obedience. Let me be very clear. Regardless of whether or not we believe it is holy or not, meaning God is holy or not, it is always going to be holy. You see, you're not taking holiness away. It's just whether or not you want holiness to bless you in your life. That's the difference. If you want holiness to bless you in your life, you must obtain holiness by believing that this book is holy because the one that wrote this book, the words in it are about life and he is holy. See, this is all about really, let me me really bring bring it home. This is about whether or not you believe in God. This is really what it's about. You're gonna leave this sanctuary and you're gonna be tested with this very word right here. Do you believe in God? Some say yes. Some say no. Because see, the people that say no, they don't see the value in his word. You see, what are you telling me? Are you telling me that two-thirds of this Bible doesn't matter? You know, when I hold this book up and you go to the New Testament, that's, that's it right there. Look at this. Observe, observe this, seriously. Old Testament, New Testament. Are, you, are, are we saying that, that, that God brought about just this and that this doesn't exist anymore? How is that possible? How is that possible? It's not. You see, it's not possible. You see, God wrote us a story and he didn't want you to take and just read part of the story. If we were watching a movie and I only watched the end of the book or the end of the movie, I wouldn't even understand what it's about. I'd be guessing. Here it is. Okay, you ready for this? Here it is. God sets the standards. Can you believe it? God sets the standards. What? Come on, stop. You think I'm kidding. You think I'm kidding. God sets the standards. Can you believe that? You see, it's not our standards. God told you what you needed to be righteous. He says, I need you to be observant of my commandments. I need you to be obedient. Oh no, Lord. 
That's difficult. I can't be obedient. I just don't love it. But what if, what if there's more to the story? You see, like I said, this is really about whether or not you love God and value him as God. This is about whether or not you think God exists. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe God exists? Let me ask you again. Do you believe God exists? So then you believe all the words in this amazing, valuable book, don't you? Amen? Psalms 33, verse 4 says, For the word of the Lord is right, and all his work is done in truth. He loves righteousness and justice, and the earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. Amen. I'm going to read that again, okay? Psalms 33, verse 4, For the word of the Lord is right, and all his work is done in truth. All of his work, not some of it, All of his work is done in truth. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. We have the option to see it or not. You see, we can be blinded by whether or not we can see the goodness of God, right? You see, we can walk and just think that the world is corrupt and everything around it is falling apart. And believe me, It might be true, but the fact is we also have a choice to believe that God is doing goodness in this world and that he's in control of all of what's going on because he's real and we have to give him that value in order to value the book that he has for us. Psalms 11 verse 7 says, For the Lord is righteous. Let me hear it. For the Lord is righteous. One more time. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. His countenance beholds the upright. The word behold means leaf nay. It means the face of God looks up to you when you are righteous. God shines his face upon you. He is gracious to you. His countenance is upon you and gives you peace. Is that familiar? We see the face of God through righteousness at that point. You know, his expectation for us is that we match his character. We replace the heart of stone and put on the heart of sincerity. Leading us down this path of truth so that we can seriously, seriously guys, obtain righteousness as he is righteous. Ezekiel 36 says in verse 26, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. God is willing to change you. He's willing to change all of us if we're willing to let him. Thinking about this vision or spiritual transformation that we're talking about is both promise, a promise of God and a testament to his power that he can change the heart of man. He can take an unbeliever that is completely unbelieving, 100% unbelieving, and make them a faith-filled believer. Can you believe it? Can you believe it? He can do that. He can do exactly that. This should speak to us right now as believers and Christians. We have the promise and experience of being made new again in Christ. And with this, we should feel empowered through the Spirit to live a life of obedience and service to God without question. See, this shouldn't be something like a burden to you. 
We shouldn't have to reason with ourselves to walk in the balance of life with God. We shouldn't have to ask the question. It shouldn't be a burden. We must believe. So let's get into a little bit about what this word in Hebrew means. So the word for righteousness, does anybody know what the word righteousness in Hebrew is? The word is zadik. And the word looks like this. Zadik is like this. You have a dalit, so a zadi, a dalit, and a kuf right here. And this word is the root of the Hebrew zadik, which means righteousness. And now right here, we're going to do this little thing that looks like that. It's a paleo-Hebrew symbol that means that he's laying on his side or he's needing something, meaning searching something. And right here, we have what they have a symbol like this, and this is a door that opens up. And over here, they have this thing here with a timeline or a sunset or the back of something. And so I want to propose to you that righteousness is about walking with God. You see, we've already gone through a couple things, but let me, let me re-illustrate. We have first the belt of truth. See, that we put on the belt of truth, and the belt of truth leads us to a place where we want to become righteous because now we see the truth. Before we didn't see the truth, but now the truth is talking to me. And guess what happens after that? We need to start, we need to start listening because now we're convinced we're, we're, it's, it's, it's like running through my, my veins. It's pumping the blood, right? And then what happens next? I need to repent because I can see that my life that I lived before this truth was no good. And I need to repent. So you come to a time of terumah. That's the Torah portion for today. Terumah, which means that you need to repent, a time of repentance. And then as you're walking, you get to righteousness because the truth leads you to righteousness. And in between, a lot of stuff happening. There's repentance taking place. There's crying taking place because you can see that the truth is setting you free. The truth is setting you free. And then you become righteous. Now, what happens? You put on the breastplate of righteousness, and guess what's next? The sandals. You got it, because now I can start walking in righteousness. You see? You start walking in righteousness. This means that searching for a door to find God. A sunset, the back of your head, like I'm not turning back. I'm not turning back. I'm searching for a door that leads to God. And I'm not turning back. I'm not looking back. I'm not going to turn into a pillar of salt. I am not turning back. I'm going to be observant of his word. I'm going to recognize that the word has value. Because if this word doesn't have value, you don't believe in God. If you don't believe in the crucifixion of the Messiah, you do not believe in God. Because it says that his son came and took the sins and put them on his shoulder and bore the sins of the world. And if you don't believe that, I'm sorry, but you don't believe in God. Because now you don't value this Bible. Sometimes we put other words. Can you believe this? Wait, ready for this? We put other books in place of this one. This one doesn't go deep enough. Are you crazy? This one's not deep enough. So let me bring out another book that has more value than the Bible. What do you think God thinks of that? A man-made book, commentary on the most valuable book in the world has more value. And it is preached in many churches, in many synagogues. That's sad. 
Because do you feel like they are fulfill, they're fulfilling the word of righteousness? Seeking a door that follows God, that, that finds God, and you're not going to look back. You're walking to the sunset. And you're not, you're not turning back. God's righteousness described only elaborates on the action and the transformation of what God can do for you in your life if you believe. I don't know how to say it any better, guys. If we don't go get the message out there, we're not doing our job. God has given you the truth He has given you righteousness so that you can go and walk with it. Not be embarrassed of it, but to let your light shine. Is this something you want? Is this something you want, Tucker? It's like Mark 2. Let's turn over to Mark 2. Mark chapter 2, verse 21 I'll just give you a moment to find that. Mark 2 in verse 21. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth. Before I get into this, I just want to tell you something. If you don't believe that God exists, you've forgotten that he's the one that gives value to this book. If you don't believe all the writings that are in this book, you are lacking a relationship with your creator. Why be made new if we are not wanting to live, or if we're wanting to live in the old? Why do we want to be changed? Why do we want to dedicate to baptism and be changed and made, made new? if we still want to live in the old self. We want to live half in and half out. No, Lord, I don't, I, I, don't, I don't want to get rid of this part of my life. I like this part of my life, but, but this over here I'm willing to give you. I'm willing to give this part to you, but, but I don't want to give this to you. You see, this, is, this I enjoy. I enjoy some of this. I'm not willing to give you that. So let's read what he has to say about that. Right here in the book of Mark, it says, no one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth onto an old garment or else the new piece pulls away from the old and it tears and the tear is made worse and no one puts new wine into old wineskins or else the new wine bursts and the wineskins and the wine is spilled and the wineskins are ruined, but new wine must be put into new wineskins. This is taken so much out of context to say that the Old Testament is completely void and now the New Testament is now, it it, it replaces the Old Testament. What if I told you that this is talking about your life as a changed individual, whether or not you cannot live partially in your old self when you become baptized and made new in Christ, you cannot adopt some of the old ways because it'll burst, it'll tear away, it doesn't work. God says you're either in or you're not in. You're either completely in or you're not in. Because what does he say about lukewarm in the book of Revelation? If I may remind you, I will vomit you out, amen. And and we don't want that. You see, God's righteousness is active always in delivering the oppressed, rescuing the needy healing the sick, raising the dead, and fulfilling his promises to his people. I would say that the Bible teaches that righteousness is as a covenant of faithfulness. It's about covenant obedience to God's commandments and reflecting his steadfast love. So how are we living out our righteousness today? As followers of of the Messiah, Followers of Christ, we are called to pursue a personal walk with him, with integrity, with righteous living. 
the means of making choices that reflect God's righteousness in all honesty, fairness, and moral purity. It's about living in a way that honors God and exemplifies our Messiah on the cross. Are we living that lifestyle? John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world this way that he gave his one and only Son, so that we believe, if we believe on him, we will not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world in this way, his, this love is not a passive love, but it is a righteous love characterized by action and sacrifice. <laughs> it's by action and sacrifice. God's love meets the highest standard of righteousness because it seeks the ultimate Good, despite the cost. Hmm. We too must count the cost. Value God as eternal. We too should set the standard of righteousness in our lives to reflect this type of love that he has shared with us. You see, God loved you so much that he gave his only begotten son for you. That is the righteousness that we should share with others. Are we willing to sacrifice our lives, our time, our dedication to give others the same as God has blessed us with? Again, God sets the standard. God sets the standard. And I believe he does it beautifully here in the scripture. The breastplate of righteousness in the book of Ephesians 6 Paul speaks of the breastplate of righteousness as a part of the armor, does he not? This image should remind us that righteousness is not only a moral maker, but our defense against the spiritual principalities and forces that seek to derail us from the path of God. That's what this is about. We need to protect ourselves from someone coming in and knocking us off the path and derailing us. Picture yourself on a roller coaster. You wouldn't want to fly off that rail, would you? It's kind of extreme, I know. Sometimes we got to get extreme here at church, right? But honestly, guys, I mean, being on a roller coaster, I mean, that's what life is about. I, and sometimes you get down low, and you... Sit there and close your eyes like this. <laughs> you go for the ride, and then sometimes you're like, just let's just bring it, bring it, you know, and your hands are up and you're hitting all the turns. And I don't know, you guys been on the uh, the cliffhanger? Because I'm gonna tell you what, you get on the cliffhanger, you're on the edge right there, and, and all of a sudden you look down and you're like, There goes my life. <laughs> and then it just drops. It's just a small, like, just just a little bit you appreciate everything and you wonder if it's coming off the rails. Well, guess what? People want to knock you off that rail, especially our young ones over here in the corner and stuff. People want to knock our young ones right off the rail. Let me, let me show you something. Let me entice you with the things of life, the flesh, the, the lusts of the flesh. Let me show you what's cool over here. Vape pens, really? Right? These are the types of things that derail our children. It's one thing after another. It, it, it goes from one thing to the next thing to the next thing to the next thing. Before you know it, it's like, what happened to my children? Where are my kids? How do they think? What do they believe? Do they even believe in God? You start questioning life. Where did I go wrong as a parent? What did I do wrong? We try to protect our children. We try to protect our loved ones. But that's, that's not always easy to do. Because guess what? The person standing right next to you, you don't know if they believe in God and value this book with the same value that you value this book. And they're, they're willing to just sit there like, oh, you know, everything's cool, and then just knock you right off the rails. Here, get off the path and start following a different one. You don't need to value this book. 
is what they're saying. Let me give you another book in place of this book that, I can, that you can value better. This book is cool, but uh, let me give you some insights that are way better than this one. Does that make any sense? But it's being embraced all over the world. That's the part that's crazy. We're living in a crazy world. Crazy world. So again, God sets the standard, does he not? He does. See, see, the breastplate of righteousness guards our hearts. It fortifies the soul. And it prepares us for the battle of holiness. And interesting enough, the chest is where all the organs are. All the vital organs, the heart, the lungs, everything, right? And this breastplate covers all of that. This gives us the spiritual insights of God protecting us through his righteous deeds. You see, everything that he has for you from truth to repentance to righteousness protects you in your walk because the next thing that's coming in the armor of God, we already know, is the sandals. We can't start walking until we're prepared. We have to put on these other elements before we can start walking. If we walk without them, we're we're walking into war and into a battle not prepared. And we'll all, we could all know, we all know where that's going to lead us if we walk into something unprepared. As we put on this breastplate of righteousness, we are promised a divine protection and a blessing over our life. Let me me share with you Matthew 5, verse 6. It says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Let me read it again. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. And in verse 10, it says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness for its sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Let me read it together. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Do you, are you thirsting for righteousness? I want more. Of, I want more. I want to be just like God. I'm thirsting for it, and I believe in him. I believe that that this book has so much value in my life that I need to turn to it when I'm hurting, when I'm sick, when I need healing, when I'm arguing with someone. This is the book that's going to help us right here. My wife has a prayer closet. She goes into her prayer closet, and it's like, there, my wife disappeared again for the next couple hours. And, And I have to share it, and I apologize, but... Um, the other day, my daughter asked, apparently, my wife if she can go in and borrow her closet. Amen. Yeah, exactly. Amen. And, and, and what, is, what is so crazy about that is like, all of a sudden, this closet, I'm, I'm scared to get next to it. I mean, I, I, I come up to the closet, and I'm like, whoa. Like, I can feel the beams coming off the doors. You know, she comes out of there all glowing and stuff. I'm like, what is going on here? Did you just receive another Ten Commandments or what? No, but all in in all honesty, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness. And for his name's sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You see, this is a promise made to us. This is a promise made to you. It's a promise made to you. This is a promise that he has in store for us. And it's through embracing this righteousness. Peace and joy are the lens of righteousness. Peace and joy are the lens of righteousness. I want to remind you that this breastplate of righteousness not only will bring you joy and peace in your life, but it will bring an eternal peace and joy in the future. You see, this wasn't just something that God's preparing for you for right now, but God is preparing this for you for the future. When God says, guess what? You're coming with me. I'm taking you to a place where there will be no more crying, no more weeping, This world will be no more. I'm bringing you to a place 
where you will receive salvation, where justice will stand, where good will be good and bad will be no more. You see, the world is different than that right now. Bad has become good and good has become bad for some reason. And that's not the way it's supposed to be. We need to not derail, guys. Let's not derail. Let's stay on course. Let's stay on the path. So let me give you some final thoughts. Be loved. I'm talking to you. Be loved, family. You're my family, and I love every one of you. We, as, as we reflect the fullness of this righteousness, let's embrace this divine calling with all of our hearts. Every bit of our heart. Let's live out the faith with integrity to pursue justice with passion and wear this breastplate of righteousness with courage. For in doing so, we will not only experience the blessings of the righteous lifestyle, but will also reflect the very heart of God to a world that is in desperate need of his love and justice. And so I leave you with this final verse, Micah 6, 8, very popular. He has, known, he has shown you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to be justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Y'all are amazing. And if you don't think so, I want you to know that God thinks so. God loves you extremely, and he values you with a value that you don't even believe. He loves you so much, you can't even fathom the love that he has for you the value that he thinks of you and you, you put all this stuff into your own head. No, I'm not valued. No, I, I, I'm not worthy. God thinks you're so worthy that he restores your soul and he gives you righteousness for his name's sake. Amen. Amen.